Okay, so we started looking at transport across membranes. We started off looking at simple diffusion, which then quickly lent into facilitated diffusion. We looked at osmosis, the movement of water across a membrane, and we also looked at active transport. Today, what we're going to look at is something that brings lots of those mechanisms together, and it's called co-transport. Let's imagine the epithelial cell in the ileum uh, of the small intestine. So let's imagine, this is the lumen, and here we've got an epithelial cell, and here we've got a blood capillary. make sense that if we were going to eat a meal that we would be losing some of that nutrition that we've absorbed that we've gone to all the trouble of digesting and it would pass out and indeed that's what would happen if we relied on facilitated diffusion to absorb the products of digestion let's think about you've just eaten a high glucose meal so the concentration of glucose is going to increase in the lumen of the ileum fantastic we know, we learned about facilitated diffusion and the idea that we've got carrier proteins uh, there, channel proteins, and that the glucose is going to move in to the epithelial cell by diffusion. And likewise, from the epithelial cell into the blood capillary, it might move in by diffusion. And that might work some of the time. But what happens when the concentration of glucose here is the same as the concentration of glucose in here. Imagine they're both at equilibrium, they're both at 50%. The transport by diffusion is then going to stop. And we need to absorb the rest of that glucose into the body, otherwise we're going to lose it. And that doesn't make sense in a survival kind of mindset. That doesn't make sense if you're going out hunting and gathering food and digesting it to then pass it out. Not least because high levels of glucose in the large intestine would make you lose a lot of water as well, which is how you end up getting diarrhea. Let's consider that epithelial cell again. It would make sense, we've learned about active transport, to have an active transport pump there and an active transport pump there, and to simply, for that last 50% of glucose that's in the ileum here, to move it against its concentration gradient using energy and then to move it into the blood using our active transport pumps here. However, we do have a way of doing that without using two active transport pumps because remember two active transport pumps is using twice as much energy to absorb your food. If we can do it without using all that energy then that's better. Let's think about that epithelial cell and how it's adapted. If this is the lumen of our ileum, and this is our blood capillary, let's imagine it's like this. On this basement membrane of the epithelial cell, I've got a active transport pump, and it's the one we learned about last lesson. It's a sodium potassium pump. So actively pumping three sodiums out, and allowing two potassiums in. Now at the moment, we're only bothered about the sodium there. We're not bothered about the potassium. So just focusing on that, if we pump three sodiums out there, what's gonna happen to the concentration of sodium inside that epithelial cell? Well, clearly it's gonna decrease. We're gonna end up with a low sodium ion concentration. So on the other side of the membrane, what we're going to imagine is that we've got this other protein. It's called a co-transport protein, and that's because it transports two things together. Sodium now wants to move into this epithelial cell. Why? Because the concentration is low. Why? Because we've pumped it out here. But for this co-transport pump to actually work, it needs to transport two things. It will only transport the sodium across, let's imagine the sodium is this shape, and that fits into there, if it transports glucose across too. So for this 
to move into here, it brings the glucose with it. Both of them move into the epithelial cell. Well, of course, now they're both in a high concentration. Well, the sodium's okay because that's going to be pumped out by the active transport pump there on the basement membrane. And now the concentration of the glucose begins to increase in there. And again, what we have, going back two lessons ago when we learned about facilitated diffusion, we've got a channel protein there that allows the passage of polar, of water-soluble substances like glucose through it, and just by diffusion, it moves into the blood capillary. So just to recap, we've got our lumen here and the lumen has a high concentration of glucose because you've just digested a meal. We want to move it into the epithelial cell and then into the blood capillary. We could have an active transport pump there and one there, but that's using twice as much energy. All we need is one on the basement membrane, an active transport pump. It pumps sodium out using ATP as it goes. As it does that, it lowers the concentration of sodium inside the epithelial cell. And so sodium wants to move in from the gut. The co-transport protein that exists in this membrane here only allows sodium to pass through if it pulls glucose with it. So we call it co-transport. And actually, it isn't fueled by active transport. ATP is not hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate directly, but indirectly it is. Indirectly it uses energy because it relies on the energy being used for this system, for this system to work. Once the glucose comes in here, the glucose is in a high concentration here and it wants to naturally move to the low concentration in the blood capillary. Why is it low concentration in the blood capillary? Because deoxygenated and um, blood that's been all around the body is coming back past the uh, gut to absorb more glucose and so because of the rich blood supply it's quickly moved on so we maintain a concentration gradient between the two. So when we've got high concentration of glucose there it's going to move through this channel um, by diffusion, facilitated diffusion into the blood capillary and away.